So I have watched White Christmas every year for as long as I can remember. And every year I have always admired the pink dress that Judy wears in The Best Things Happen While You're Dancing. Something about the drape, elegance, swoosh, and tasteful sparkliness of that dress has caught my eye since childhood. And last year was no different. I was sitting on the couch with the family, eating clementines and Toblerones, watching White Christmas, and that scene came on, and as I was watching, I had a light bulb moment. I can sew. I could make Judy's dress. I could have that dress. And thus began a year-long saga of research and construction. The overarching challenge with this project came in the fact that with this dress being a custom design for the movie, there is no pattern. You can't just go to simplicity.com and buy Judy Pink Dress Pattern 1954. In fact, the only reference images you can find of the dress are from screen capping the scene. Thankfully, Paramount uploaded a high def version, which was an absolute blessing. But still, I knew that this was going to have to be an amalgamation of multiple patterns and a whole lot of winging it. And there are a couple other minor challenges that need to be taken into consideration. One, I am not Edith Head with a Hollywood budget. I am a hobby costumer sewing in my bedroom with the budget to match. Two, I am not a 95 pound rocket, and my torso has more curves than Vera Allen's, so there's naturally going to be some difference in the bodice silhouette. So this is going to be closer to an homage rather than 100% screen accurate recreation. But I am doing my utmost best to get as close as my time, skills, and budget will allow. So with that said, let's dive into making this thing. As with all projects, it's best to start from the underlayers and work your way out. From the footage, we can see there is some kind of darker pink underskirt slash petticoat. In my initial research, I thought this was simply a full-bodied satin petticoat, so I went with a simple circle skirt design using a moderate weight satin to give it some structure. This skirt only had three seams, which made the basic construction super easy. And for the center back, I started the seam about 10 inches down from the waist edge for ease of getting in. I quickly top stitched the raw edges of the back seam, and although I didn't get it on camera, I machine felled the seams to hide all the other raw edges. Then the waistband was attached to the right side of the skirt by machine, folded over, and finished by hand with a whip stitch. I let the skirt hang for a few days to let any bias stretch work itself out, and then I began the hem. Circle skirts are notoriously tricky to hem, but as long as you do a narrow hem, it works out pretty well. You start by making a line of stitching close to the edge of the hem, then iron it up, and then press and fold it over a second time. And then it just gets stitched down, which is more time consuming than it is complicated. Everybody always underestimates just how much material goes into the hem of a circle skirt. It's a lot of hem. I fastened it with a hook and eye, and it was done. And I thought that was all I'd need for the underlayers, but when the time came to try it on with all the skirt layers together, I realized it still needed a little bit more poof. So I went back to the screen caps, and it turns out that when you really zoom in and look super close, you can just see a hint of crinoline in there as well. And for a 50 silhouette, that makes a lot of sense. So I cheated and bought a pink crinoline off Le Bezos Boutique, and it was definitely the right call. That extra layer of tulle makes all the layers sit exactly how they're supposed to. And speaking of layers, onto the skirt itself. From what we can see, there are three layers to the skirt of this dress. One of taffeta to help give that A-line structure, and two of chiffon for the floaty effect. These start out in the same way as the underskirt, and with the width of my fabrics being what they were, I cut my circle skirt in three pieces, one half circle for the front and two quarter circles for the back. I started with the pink taffeta layer, and I made sure to cut it a little bit longer than my underskirt. Then we moved on to chiffon, and after working with organza with my layer cake dress, I was initially a bit intimidated, but I absolutely love chiffon now. It's like night and day compared to organza. And then all three layers get stitched together in pretty much the same way as the underskirt. Mm -hmm. 
To secure the raw edges, I decided to face my old nemesis again. French seams. As much as I try to avoid this style of seam finishing, it really is the best option for floaty fabrics like chiffon. I started by trimming down all the seam edges nice and narrow. This allows for the raw edges to be enclosed and gets rid of the fluffy selvage edges as well. Then the seams get pressed open, folded over, and pressed again, and since it's a long seam, pinned to hold everything in place. The seams are sewn down again, and when done right, all the raw edges are completely enclosed inside this line of stitching. I basted all the layers together at the waistline, and then let the skirt hang for about five days to let the bias stretch out. After the bias had stretched out and the hems were trimmed, they were ready to be hemmed. I knew this was going to be a long job. My math put the combined length of the three layers that need to be finished at around 20 yards of hemline. So to maximize my sewing time, I prepped three bobbins with my thread ahead of time so that when one inevitably ran out, I could just swap it out and keep on sewing. And for the taffeta layer, it was the exact same process as the underskirt. Narrow line of stitching, press the hem up, and stitch down again. For the chiffon layers, I knew it was going to be a bit more tricky, so I bought a rolled hem to try and make things easier. Newsflash, it was not easier. I tried a number of times to make this thing work, and I couldn't figure it out at all. So if anyone has any tips on how to make a rolled hem foot work, please leave them in the comment below. I would love to know. I ended up going back to my regular sewing foot and carefully rolling the hem by hand, and I'm quite happy with the result. And then it was time to put the skirt away for a little while to focus on the bodice. It's probably not surprising that this was the part that scared me the most. There's so much going on here. There's an under bodice that's fairly smooth, there's a chiffon overlayer, there's a funky collar, there's the whole bust ruching situation, and sleeves, but we'll tackle those later. I looked for a long time trying to figure out a pattern option for this. I bought one that I thought would work close enough, made a mock-up and went, that ain't even close. So I settled on a mashup of two patterns. For the under bodice, I went with a basic sweetheart neckline strapless bodice and cut two layers out of the taffeta. For my own modesty comfort, I added extra seam allowance along the top and bottom edges. I had been racking my brain trying to figure out how to add structure to the underbodice without it being visible, and on one of my thrifting trips, I had the idea to look at a modern gown and see how it was put together, and I found that there was an extra layer of fabric and some boning at key seams. So I swung by the fabric store and picked up this super cute pink fabric. Would plain muslin have worked just as well and cost half the price? Maybe? What? It's Christmas. And then I cut out a layer from this fabric. The actual construction of this pattern was remarkably simple, the hardest part being the curve along the bust seams. I stitched the front side pieces to the center front first, and then the side back pieces to the back pieces. I pressed everything open, and then joined the sides to the front. and repeat it with the taffeta layers. Then I took one of the taffeta layers and matched it up with the lining layer, wrong sides facing each other. I stitched along the sides and bottom edge to secure everything together, and then on the two sets of straight seams, I made boning channels. Thankfully, I had some leftover synthetic baleen from when I made my Victorian corset, so I was able to cut it, smooth it, and prep it quite quickly. Mm -hmm. 
Side note, there is also what looks like a belt on this dress, so I quickly cut a layer each of cotton lining, taffeta, and chiffon to make one up. For the over bodice, I actually used my shindig Kaylee bodice pattern. I made a quick mock-up and was pretty happy with how it sat, so I cut it out of the chiffon. This mock-up pattern has no seam allowance, so I made sure to add it in when cutting out. It gets a quick dart at the back, and then I tackled the princess seams at the front. I wanted to make sure the seams wouldn't fray, but also that they would be as hidden away as possible, so I finished them with a narrow zigzag stitch and then trimmed them close. At last it was time to attach the bodice to the skirt and make this thing into a dress. I joined the bodice in two stages, first the inner layer with the boning, and then the outer layers, the single layer of taffeta and the chiffon over bodice. This way, the raw edges of the skirt were sandwiched in between, meaning I didn't have to worry about finishing those edges. To finish off the top edge of the under bodice, I attached a ribbon as binding. A narrow seam along the right side of the fabric, a quick turn to the wrong side, and then machine stitched hem for speed. Then I made the shoulder seams, once again using a French seam to minimize bulk. Oh yeah, it also needs a zipper. Seeing as the last zipper I put into a garment was three years ago with my shindig Kaylee bodice, I was a little nervous. And when nerves hit, I turned hand sewing. This gives me a lot more control, especially around the finicky parts. I used a prick stitch for its strength and low visibility. And then I whipped down any raw edges near the zipper. I also hemmed the back edges of the over bodice with a whip stitch. If the bodice as a whole was scary, we're now at the part of the bodice that scared me the most. The ruching detail. This is a very 3D effect, and would be challenging to attempt by just laying it on the floor. I do not have a dress form, and I didn't want to attempt pinning it while wearing it. That just sounded like a recipe for bloodshed. Now, a day may come perhaps in the not too distant future, when I have the space for a dress form of my own. But it is not this day. Thankfully, a branch of my local library is entirely devoted to creative arts and makers. They have a green screen, they have AV equipment, they have musical instruments, a 3D printer, embroidery machines, and an adjustable dress form. So, time for a field trip. This made a world of difference, and I can only imagine how even more of an improvement a custom fit dress form would be. I used a copious amount of pins to get everything the way I wanted, and since I had a theater matinee to get to, I basted everything down to hold all my pleats together and hand-stitched everything at home. I was still scared by sleeves, so I jumped right over to embellishments. The skirt has a number of applique-type sparkly things, so I bought a bunch off Etsy and got to work hand-stitching each one in place. I have never worked with appliques before, especially with a fabric like chiffon, so this was a journey. But I liked the journey. Then it's time for sequins. 
I had originally bought pink ones, but when they arrived they were Barbie pink instead of dusty pink, so I went with clear ones instead. I started with a line along the top of the bodice, and yes, every sequin is hand-stitched in place. Okay, time for sleeves. I found a great pattern off Etsy, made a couple of mock-ups until I was happy, and got to work. These were fairly easy with just one straight seam, which again I finished with a French seam. I did a wide rolled cuff which I top stitched in place, leaving a little gap so I could thread some elastic. That's what gives that beautiful flowy look. I pinned them into my bodice, and to save what was left of my sanity, I sewed them in by hand, using little back stitches for security. And a chaotic Saturday meant I had to be out of the house for a few hours, so it was back to the library to sew. I finished the raw edges of the sleeves with a roll, gathered, okay I don't know what to call it type of hem. All I know is it works and is comfortable. And I popped back up to the dress form to fit the collar. I used a bit of ribbon for extra stability as I was a little worried about the chiffon holding up under strain. Then I draped on the collar and stitched it on by hand. I folded the raw edges of the taffeta under and secured them with a herringbone stitch. Then I folded under the chiffon and whip stitched it into place. The original dress has a whole lot of sequins on the collar, as well as extending down onto the bodice, and while I would have loved to have attempted an exact reproduction, this was now 3pm on December 23rd, and my goal was to wear it for Christmas Eve. So I pulled out another applique I had bought, carefully cut it into smaller pieces, and MacGyvered a pretty darn close replica. And yes, I was sewing the final sequins at 9pm that night while watching White Christmas. And despite a whole lot of hiccups along the way, it was ready to wear for Christmas Eve.
Well, that was an adventure. Obviously my final project of 2023 and I would definitely say I went out with a bang. There were highs, there were lows, there was a massive amount of imposter syndrome when my brain made the connection that Hokey Dinah. I am attempting to recreate a dress designed by the iconic, nay legendary, Edith Head. Who the heck do I think I am? But ultimately, I fulfilled my goal to have Judy's pink dress and my childhood self is pretty happy right now. Are there parts of it that I may have done differently if I had had the time and resources? Oh yeah. Like any project I make, I could totally pick apart things about this that I wish I had done a little different, and maybe someday down the road I might do something about it. I certainly have enough extra fabric to do so, but for now, I am calling this a success. It is gloriously swooshy, the sleeves are everything I hoped they would be, and the level of sparkle makes my magpie brain very satisfied. And with that, I wish you all a happy new year, and I will see you all in 2024 with more Geekery Meets History sewing adventures.